if I only had an hour to live and I had a choice to be a free thinker or a Christian the choice is quite stark and clear and obvious on the one hand the Bible teaches that God created the world and I see evidence for this the Bible gives me the Ten Commandments a right way to live and I know that I'm a sinner through it and that Christ died on a cross and rose again and is the Son of God and he gives a testation to the Old Testament I trust in Christ because of the evidence of who he is and the reality of him in my own life but if I was to trust free thinking there is no hope when I come to death life would have been meaningless ultimately on a cosmic level not not individually but on a cosmic level meaningless and my death no hope whatsoever yet if I believe in Christ I'm believing in a person who tells no lies and who lived a perfect life and who died and rose again and if I believe in him I will rise again so there is hope where there is no hope in atheism and I can trust this creator God to have worked in cultures and used the culture i.e. the Old Testament times with all the, sacri the sacrificial and all the stuff that happened in the Old Testament I can trust the God that he did the right thing as far as he was concerned my issue is I've got to not believe the God of creation acknowledge my sin and trust in his son Jesus Christ and that is a greater confidence than atheism where there is no hope at all this is solid ground atheism isn't even a ground to stand on so it doesn't pass what I would call the death test what is your life? it is a vapor the bible says your life is like a puff of steam it's here for a moment and then it's gone my name's Kevin. I grew up in Manchester, in England, into, in the 70s, into a background. In those days, he was either considered a Roman Catholic or, like us, we was considered an Anglican, which is Church of England. Now, we never went to church. All that means is I was christened as a child. Infant baptism is a big ritual there. It's a big superstition. People believe that you can't get into heaven without some sort of infant ritual and so the only times in my childhood I set foot in a church was at one of these christenings or was at somebody's wedding and then when I got to secondary school or high school I just professed to be an atheist back in those days but really even though I didn't know much about the Bible back then and I didn't know much about Jesus Christ. I did really know one thing. I knew deep down it was all true. Even in the days when I professed to be an atheist, there was just something inside of me, a nagging thought, my conscience, which just told me it was all true. And so as time went on, I left school and I just became a, a big sinner. I drank up as much sin as I could in various ways and I did things which are real shameful to speak about in that time. And, and so time went on and I just became a worse and worse sinner. And I got to my mid-twenties and I started asking those questions that everybody asks at some point in life. Why are we here? And what happens when this life is over? And I would philosophize. I remember each day I would just philosophize more and more. And I'd come up with the most silliest interpretations of things. And I would, this would keep on going. But I knew there was a God at this time. I just looked at the whole creation, the Bible says, declares his handiwork. And my conscience, again, just keeps telling me this is true. And at first I would look at other religions. I wanted to become anything but a Christian. And I remember I looked at things like Buddhism, but it was just all fairy tale stuff. I just could not, it was just nonsense really. And then 
eventually I started to open the Bible and look at it as like a history book. It was an old Bible that would, was passed down the family from my granddad. And I just started in Genesis verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And, and I just kept on reading and it seemed to make sense. And now I didn't have... I didn't really understand it at that time and I was trying to interpret it through my atheistic worldview. I still had, even though I wasn't an atheist, I still had a naturalistic worldview. I remember reading about the manna in the desert. I was thinking, that, well, that must be snow. These people must not really understand these primitive people. And, but. I still knew it was all true and so and about the same time I started to go to a high Anglican church which is basically it's, it's like Catholicism but without the Pope it's all prayer book rituals the sermons there are only 10 to 15 minutes and there wasn't really the gospel preached there the message of how to get saved and what truth I did hear there was all surrounded in hypocrisy it was all filtered through that now I was, was doing things in that time. I just became more and more religious. I thought I was a Christian for about six years. I went to that church, but I, I never knew, knew Jesus Christ. I never really knew him. And, but there was so much hypocrisy going on. I mean, for instance, me, myself, you would have thought for an hour and a half on a Sunday, I was deeply religious. But for the rest of the week, I just live like a complete hypocrite. You know, I'd go to nightclubs and, and things and, and do shameful things, and then I'd be in church on a Sunday. Now, I knew that was wrong, but I'd look at other people in the church and, and they'd be getting blind drunk as well on a Saturday night. And, and I just think, well, they've been Christians longer than me. And so that this time just went on and, and on like this, and eventually, I, I always knew that there was something more to Christianity I didn't have. No, of course it was Jesus Christ because in this time God was just always a, a distant deity to me. He, he was just, I didn't really know him. I mean, I had a cliche, you know, I'd say I've got a relationship with Jesus. Christianity is a relationship with Jesus, but I, I didn't really know him. And, and so I started to, to listen to sermons and messages and look at teachings outside of the church I was in. And I was going through a series on the Sermon on the Mount and then one day I was sat in the garden listening to a sermon and I heard the words of Jesus from Matthew 5, 27 to 30 where Jesus said, you have heard that it was said of old, you shall not commit adultery, but I say unto you, if you look at a woman to lust after her, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. And Jesus went on to say there, you know, cast your eye out because it is better to enter heaven with one eye than to enter hell with, with both. And, and now the, the context there is, of course, adultery. It's not saying it's a sin for a man to have sexual desire for his wife and vice versa, but... Jesus does clearly say in those verses that to lust over someone you're not married to is a sin that will surely take you to hell if it's not repented of. Now, I had heard those verses many times before, and in fact, I remember discussing it only a few weeks earlier, and just ex I explained them away every time, saying surely it doesn't mean what, he's, what he says there, because everybody does that. Everybody just lusts all the time. But that day when I heard those words of Jesus, I, I knew it. He meant what he said. I, I, I knew for the first time I, I realized that God was a holy God who I could no longer play games with. And, and in all this, I just, it just felt like the, the love of, of Jesus Christ because I realized that God could have killed me. I mean, my life is in his hands and he could have killed me and put me in hell a week before or a year before or two years before knowing the shameful things I did. And he would have been perfectly just in doing so. But the kindness and the long suffering of God, which is meant to lead a person to repentance, led me to repentance because I just saw the great love of God in I'd been mocking him for so long and playing games with God and and he just loved me and he just died for me. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, the Bible says, He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. 
Jesus Christ on a cross 2,000 years ago, he became a sin offering for us. He became a sin offering for me. He died in my place. And, and on that cross, the, all the guilt of my sin, the shame of my sin, the, just all my wrongdoings I ever did was placed upon Jesus on that cross. And, but, and not only did Jesus pay for that, but, and, and take away all my sin, so there is therefore now no condemnation left for me because Christ has already been condemned in my place. But he also lived a righteous and perfect life. You see, the greatest commandments in scripture we are told is to love God the Father with all our heart, soul, mind and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Now, in the life of Jesus, he always perfectly loved God the Father with all his heart, soul, mind and strength and he always perfectly loved his neighbor as himself for every millisecond of his life. But since become a Christian, we never do that for even one second. We never perfectly love God. But from the moment I believed on Jesus Christ, from the, from the moment I saw his great love for me, then not only was all my sin gone, gone forever, as far as the east is from the west, the Bible says he remembers our sin no more, but God now looks at me as if I have lived the perfect righteous life of Jesus Christ. So God now looks at me and says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And it, the cross of Jesus Christ is such a wonderful thing. That there's an old hymn that goes, Oh, my sin, oh, the joy of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, not just part of my sin, but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. Oh, and if you, you don't know Jesus, if you was like me with just not knowing, if you, not knowing your sins forgiven, not really knowing God, then I plead with you, Jesus really paid it all for you on that cross. He paid every drop of, of my wrath in hell, all of my hell, Jesus paid for on the cross. And that is what he did. And it, for, for us, if you will come to him, if you will surrender to him, I, I plead with you, Jesus, he doesn't want part of your life. He wants all of your life. And he is so worthy. He is so good. He is so kind and altogether lovely. I, I had no life. I just had a miserable, worthless and pathetic life for so much of my life. I wasted so much of my life. But it was by coming to Jesus Christ, I now have true joy, true peace of the heart and true life. And he offers that to you if you'll come to him and he offers you that to you this day. You see, the love Jesus has for the believer is just perfect. It, I mean, the Bible says, as the Father, uh, as Jesus said, as the Father has loved me, even so I have loved you. You know, the Song of Solomon says that Jesus, he comes to the believer leaping across the mountains. After all my sin and all my shame before God, when I go to him, Jesus comes running to me with his arms open wide, hands that were pierced for me, with holes in for my sin. And he just comes to us ready to embrace us in his everlasting love for us. Eternity, the next life is forever. There is nothing more important than being right with God for eternity. The Bible says it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment, after death, there are no second chances to get right with God. But you must make peace with God before you meet Him. I'llBeHonest.com And my uncle died. Well, he was my great uncle, actually, and was really close with him. And it was such a shock for me because my uncle was in my prayers all the time, you know, and I was praying as a child. And I couldn't really understand it properly, but 
I still had no bitterness though, you know, against the Lord and I still kept on praying for all the other family. And then I just remember then starting secondary school and then as I entered secondary school, suddenly like things come in, like the word of God says, you know, things come in and they, and they snatch, you know, the word away from you. Or they, I, I didn't really even have a word because I still at this point didn't even know what the gospel was, but they, they were snatching whatever bit of truth I had away. Friends were coming in. Um, just uh, being in the secondary school, just so many things, so many things. And um, and the friends that I had as well, there was a, exactly the same situation as me, never had any Christian upbringing, nothing. And um, I just, I don't know. And then it was like um, I almost became embarrassed then before them to think that I could even think you know, uh, of Jesus Christ or that there is a God. And then obviously then as you go through secondary school and, and evolution comes in and, and from the television, from secondary school, from all walks of life, you can't get away from it. And suddenly it was almost like, yeah, of course there's, there's no God. You know, I actually like, you know, would, I remember a teacher at secondary school saying, um, who in here believes in God? And I remember looking around thinking, oh, nobody's going to put their hand up. And I remember this one girl called Jennifer Clegg put her hand up, and she must be so brave, you know, when she put her hand up. And I just thought, wow, you know, how silly. How silly, you know. And then I remember him saying, you know, and, and who, so I take it then everybody else is an atheist, and everybody was like so quick, you know, to put their hands up. You know, it's like it's a big bragging thing. You know, yes, of course, I'm an atheist. And... And basically, so that's where I was through my secondary um, school. And, and then, obviously, then my life reflected that. Because there isn't a God, we're not accountable to anybody. What does it matter, you know? I'm not saying I was a horrible out-and-out -out person, but then at the same time, <laughs> through, like, my, my years growing up, um, I wouldn't even speak of the things, you know, that, that, that happened in those years. And um, it would be a shame. And... And then I met Kevin, and we was very young, um, and our lives really together was just your you normal, um, you know, relationship of the world, really. You know, you, you don't really have to get married. You know, you can still do what you want to do, really. You know, you don't have to make a commitment. And then we got engaged, and it was together for like, engaged for like 10 years, you know, and then... And then I got pregnant with Dylan, who's my oldest son. And life really began to change. Um, we had a baby on the way. We wasn't married. Um, and just, I think life really sank in that we'd have to kind of, you know, we're, we're, we're soon to be parents, responsibility. And then... Um, we had a terrible time and we actually um we split up and um and then when i had dylan sorry when i had dylan um we just i think dylan was about two no 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 he would have been about six months old and i remember um just i don't know wanting to run away from life um, and just wanting to get away from everything, really, to be honest. And then Kevin, um, one morning I, I woke up and he just wasn't there. And was in this house at the time, because we moved in when I had Dylan, so this was like six months down the line. He wasn't there, and I thought, where's he gone? Where's he gone? And, and to be honest with you, I thought, he's gone. He's left. You know, he's had enough, he's left. Um, and then he came back around about like dinner time ish. I said, Where have you been? Where have you been? And he said, um, I don't know. He said, I just woke up this morning and I felt the Lord. No, he didn't say I felt the Lord. But he just said, I felt like I had to go to church. <laughs> and, um, and it was the local Anglican church. And I remember thinking, Church, what's he going to church for? You know, this is crazy. You know, who goes to church nowadays? And um, he started going there every Sunday. and. Um, and he was coming back, and and the Lord was just driving him to go to church. Um, and then Kevin wasn't converted at this point, but then he was. We was there 
basically he he then started to take me along because everybody was saying to him oh bring your girlfriend and your son you know why are they not coming so i started coming along with kevin and i remember going there to the anglican church and um i just i remember thinking wow this is just like taking me back into the past you know all these memories coming back of like being at school and in the church and with my grandma and and i remember starting to sing songs and things and and I don't know, you know, something within me then started to, like, light again, in a sense. I still didn't know the truth. I still didn't know the gospel, but there was something there, you know, some kind of, the Lord doing something, some kind of work. And, um, I guess I was there for seven years, and then after that seven years, one day, I mean, you probably, you've all heard Kevin's testimony, I don't know. Kevin was in the garden, and, um, that day was, um, I mean, I remember that day he came in the house and he, and he couldn't keep still. He's walking around, you know, and we, we, we didn't know what being born again was that day. We didn't know. Um, but from that day onwards, Kevin just changed. He, he just completely changed. And But then you see, rather than that me kind of um, making everything okay, it was then even harder of a battle for me. Because I thought, oh no, what's going on? What's going on? And then all Kevin could do was just reading his Bible all the time. You know, he'd, he'd go to every meeting at the Anglican church. He wouldn't miss one. And then he started writing like magazine. He, was, he would just had this passion for God. And um, But then rather, I, then I, I started to read the Bible. And, and rather than sort of like read it to find truth, I was reading it to find fault. And every time I found something in the Bible um, that really just like aggravated me and like, like for instance, um, when Jesus says, you know, um, to pluck out your eye and to, you know, to cut off your right hand, you know, it, um, and, and I'd pick these texts up and I'd be like, oh, this is ridiculous. How can people do this? You know, how can you, that, that's just nonsense. Anything I could grab hold of, I would, I'd start trying to almost tear Kevin's faith down and almost try to, I just wanted to. I just didn't want the Bible. I just didn't want the Bible because I. And then anyway, I remember as well. Then I started to kind of Kevin. We then went to a Calvary Chapel church, which was, um, I, you know, met some lovely people there. But what I started to do was then because the people were so nice and so lovely, I started to try to fit in which is the worst thing anybody can ever do. Never try and fit in. If you know you're not right with God, never try and fit in. It's the worst thing you can do. And, and so then because I was trying to fit in, I was trying to convince myself that I, I actually know I, I, I knew the Lord. You know, I was trying to convince myself. So then, because everybody was just so lovely, so caring, and I, I'd read my Bible, and, and I'd read it, but I'd not read it... Um, I wouldn't read it with like an honest truth of trying to seek what God wanted for my life. And, and I'd, I'd, I'd read it without really believing as well the promises of God and what I was reading. And then um, and, and another example as well I was just thinking of was when I, 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 I was ashamed as well because I remember like going to like with family and, and friends and things and and I'd always think, oh no, Kevin, please don't, don't start talking about the Lord. Please not here. Don't start talking about the Lord. Please not, not here. And I, I, and I couldn't relax for fear that Kevin might actually tell somebody, you know, about the Lord. I, and, 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 he was and, and I remember like, even in the car, you know, he'd have music on sometimes and if he'd like had the window down and I think other people could hear the Christian music being played, I'd want to like wind the windows up, you know, and, and oh, it, it, it really was just, um, yeah, it was it was almost as if I, I was embarrassed. And then, um, from that, I'll kind of move on a bit as well. Um, Kevin got um, asked if he'd go and pastor a church in Fleetwood. And we went there, and at this point, again, I just I just thought, you know, I, I, I knew the Lord. I felt I'd really grown, and I'd gained so much knowledge. Um, and I, I, I'd convinced myself I, 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 I was fine with the Lord, absolutely convinced myself I was fine with the Lord. And um, anyway, our time in Fleetwood um, was a lovely time. And then again, as soon as Kevin started to touch on the gospel and one of his sermons about being born again, there were so many people that were so angry 
um, because Kevin had preached, you must be born again. And, um, and the amazing thing was as well, is that actual sermon even angered me a bit. I remember going home thinking, um, and, and I said to Kevin, I said, I said oh, you can't preach like that. You can't preach, this is, this is an Anglican church. You, you can't preach like that. Telling people they must be born again. It, look all the people you've offended, that's it now, you know. It, I was no better than them, but at the time I still didn't know I was like them. I thought I, I knew God. And, and rather than support Kevin, all, all I did was just pull Kevin down. I just pulled him down and pulled him down. I was not a godly wife whatsoever. It was terrible. And then um, I remember actually going to the bathroom at Fleetwood. And I remember getting down on the floor and I even said to the Lord. And it was the first time really that I'd kind of like come to God, like knowing I had nowhere else to go because I had to come because it really was desperate times for us at these times. And I remember getting on the bathroom floor and just saying, Lord, where, where, what's happening? What's going on? You know, we're here in this church. And I think the people just want us to go. Where, where are we going? What are we supposed to do? And the scripture even came to me where um, the Lord Jesus says, you know, the, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. And I just think the mercy of God, because he could even speak to me then. And I was miles away from me, you know, the grace of God and the mercy of God. And I just got up off the floor and it was like an answer. And I just knew from that point we weren't staying. You know, didn't even have to wait for like what the people had to say. It was like the Lord had told us we were going, you know. And um, so anyway, um, this was um, 2009, Christmas 2009, we came back. And then after we came back then, because I'd set all my hopes up, on Kevin kind of having this church and we was going to have this lovely um, man's house to live in, you know, and, and, and a lovely church and I had all this like fairy tale nonsense in my head really. And the Lord had like, it's almost like he just swept the rug from under my feet, you know, all, all my hopes and all my dreams had just gone. So we came back to this house and I just fell into complete depression, complete and utter depression because, um, I didn't know where I was anymore. I didn't know what we were supposed to be doing anymore. And um, my life was just, I was just depressed, constantly depressed all the time, you know, moping around. And um, and then um, I was even reading a book actually by Martin Lloyd-Jones called Spiritual Depression. And um, and it actually, it, it, it helped. And um, so I started to, to seek God a bit more earnestly. And then, well, then it was it was 2009, it'll be, and it was the, the 9th of March, and it was a Monday morning, and I was sat in that corner where Evelyn sat now on the purple settee, and um, I just, I was just really, really down, and the night before, I was reading in Romans, um, I wasn't reading Romans chapter 10, I was actually reading Romans chapter 11, where basically um, Paul talks about um, the vine, you know, and, and if we being grafted in, how much more should we live for Christ, you know? But it, that had like, it had, it, it wasn't, it wasn't doing anything. I was kind of, my mind was all over the place. And, um, and then my eyes jumped to Romans chapter 10, verse um, 13. And um, and I've heard it said it's like sometimes when you're reading the Bible, it's like you've got 3D glasses on, and you you know, and the the scripture just jumps out at you. It's like, Shh. this is what happened. And I just saw the scripture. It said, "For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved." And that night I went to bed crying over that scripture. I said, "Lord, your word says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved." I said, "Lord, I don't know if you're true." I don't know if you're real. I said, but your word says this. I said, Lord, you've got to save me. And that night, I was like this, just crying and burdened. And and the weight, I can't describe to you, this weight I had on me. And um, like I said, I was sat where Evelyn sat now, the following morning. And um, I just said, God... I cannot go on like this. I asked you last night, your word says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I feel no different. So I got up from there and I went into the kitchen 
I just poured my heart out to God. Absolutely everything, any kind of like anger I had towards people, family, friends, Kevin even, just everything just came out. Absolutely everything that was on my heart just came out to God and it was just, it was everything, just, just all me feeling sorry for myself, everything came out. And then, as I was like just pouring out everything to God, suddenly it was like, um, I can't describe it. Um, it was like, the Lord had just sort of like, I don't know, it's like when you're pulling off a jumper and it's inside out, it's like the Lord did that to me. And he, and he showed me myself. And for the first time in my life, the things I saw, what the Lord revealed to me that morning was absolutely disgusting. I'd never seen such a vile person. And I just broke down. Because I was just such a vile person. And the Lord had truly shown me my sin. And then all of a sudden, it was like, um, I can't describe it really. It was almost like a, like a vision like of the cross and almost like I saw the Lord Jesus on the cross like here and it was like for the first time in my life I, the Lord, I, should, I saw I, I was a sinner and I saw that the Lord Jesus Christ had actually died for me for my sins for the very first time in my life and it absolutely broke me it broke me and I just um I just came to the Lord, I was like, Lord, forgive me, how dare I say this about these people, how dare I say that about my husband, how dare I say, it was just, oh dear, and then, and then after that, it was like, it's like the, 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 the you know, when the Lord was baptised, and it says, and the, and the spirit of God descended like a dove, that's all I can describe it, it was like this, this the, the spirit of God just descended. It's like a, a peace, an absolute peace, and all this burden that I was carrying with me from just life. It just like it was like lifted. It was it was gone. It was just it was like um, John Bunyan in the Pilgrim's Progress. And he's got this big backpack on his back, and then suddenly just like drops the backpack off. It was like that. It was like I was free. You know, for the first time in my life, it was like. I, I was absolutely ec ecstatic at that moment. It, it was wonderful. And I was just like bounding, and, and and it's like it's like the sun had suddenly like just come up, and and it was shining through the window in the kitchen, and it was like, I was like, wow, I'm free. You know, it's like, it's forgiven me. Lord Jesus has forgiven me, and I just came bounding out of the kitchen, jumping about and everything, and I ran up the stairs, and as I got to the top of the stairs, I was like thinking, oh, I can't tell Kevin. The Lord saved me, can I? I thought, he, he thinks I'm already saved, you know. But that I just, I, it, it, I, I couldn't. I, I, I just went bounding in the bedroom, and I, and and Kevin was reading his Bible. I'm like, Kevin, the Lord saved me. The Lord saved me. The Lord saved me. And Kevin's like, he's completely you no know, speechless, and he didn't know what to say because I was just, I was just full of it, and he couldn't stop me. You know, I was like, oh. <laughs> I was just so excited. And then it was just like started smiling, and then he was like laughing, and then the children came in, and it, oh. Oh dear. I came back downstairs and um, I don't know, the rest of that day was just amazing for me. It was absolutely amazing and um, it was just wonderful. And then um, I remember me, um, my mum come that same day and I told her what had happened. And she was trying to explain it all the way, you know, it's like, oh, well, you, you just poured out your heart, you know, you, you, you feel better, really, you know, you've had a good cry, and, you know, you put, you, everybody feels better, you know, <laughs> I, was like, I was like, oh, no, and I was like, mommy, you just don't understand, and I, and I remember she was going, and, and I went to give her a hug, but this feeling I got as I went to give her a hug, it was like, uh, like a weight when I went to give her a hug it was a weight and it was a law telling telling me you know your mum doesn't know me your mum doesn't know me and you know where she's going now and it was like a, a grief and then so you know and and I just I just wish that that weight sometimes would come back you know for the loss because I, I feel sometimes I feel like um I do the Lord a disfavor because I feel like I don't do enough you know I I should be, um, sometimes I feel like I should be going to family and sitting down with family, you know, one by one. And maybe that's what the Lord's telling me to do even now, you know, to just... Um, and um, 
yeah, and that so that was the day that I came to the Lord, and um, and I do remember though the week after that, um, I actually sort of started to lose like that kind of being up here with the Lord, you know, and because I I'd, I'd neglected reading my Word and because I was living on a high, you know, it's almost like oh I don't need the Word now, you know, and um, but then I remember. Um, the the song I went to a funeral that week. It was my uncle's, and it was um it was a, the song that's like, "Do not be afraid, for I have redeemed thee. I have called you by your name. You are mine." And I didn't have a clue that that was Isaiah, and it was only when a friend told me that it was Isaiah, and I read that scripture, and um and and I just hold on to that now. You know, I've redeemed you. I've called you by your name. You're mine. That that's my you know my scripture now for. Forever and, 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 and the other one of course as well, you know, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, you know, and um and I yeah, I just wanted to make sure that, you know anybody here as well who may feel they don't know, again just read the word of God, believe what it says and ask what it tells you to, you know, anybody. Um but that's my testimony anyway, so <laughs> My name is David, I'm 44 years old, and this is the testimony of how Jesus Christ saved me from 27 years of homosexuality. I speak these things in love, not out of hatred. I speak these things out of somebody who's been there, who knows what it's like, who, who knows what it's like to, to live in that, who knows how hopeless it is. Sure, you may enjoy your life, you may enjoy aspects of your life, you may enjoy the sexual, aspects of it, the alcohol, what have you, but but there's really no permanent joy in it. Eventually it goes away and you have to do more, you have to seek more. So I ask you to look for the real love, the real joy, the real contentment that can only be found in being made right with God through Christ, through Christ's work on the cross. So I speak these things from love, not, not from hate. I, I speak these things not in judgment, you know, I, I'm not judging somebody. I'm, I'm just telling you what the Word of God says. The Word of God is what's going to judge us. In fact, the Word of God is what says all these things are wrong. I'm only telling people what the Word of God says. Like somebody should have told me, my friend who did try to tell me, he tried to tell me in the, in the nicest way, in a Christian way, that I was living a lifestyle that was contrary to what God wanted, not just in my, my sexual orientation, but in every other aspect. He knew, I, he knew I was not really a Christian. So I speak these things in love, and I, I pray for your soul, and I pray that you will receive these things, and that you will cry out to the Lord to save you, and to make you a new creature, because He is mighty to save, and He will save you. As I turned into my teens, we stopped going uh, quite as much. My parents started having problems, and, um, and eventually my parents divorced, and sometime later my mom remarried. And after she was remarried, we started going back to church again. And I remember being kind of glad that I was going back to church, but it was all superficial. I, I would listen to the hymns and get emotional, and about that time my friends started going down front and making professions of faith and so one Sunday I was moved by feelings and by the music and what my friends had done and I went down front and made a decision for Christ. I didn't really know what I was doing or understand what was really taking place. I just knew something was wrong and all my friends had done it so I felt compelled to do it. So. I walked down front and I sat down in the front pew and the deacon came over and told me I needed to accept Jesus into my heart and he told me to repeat this prayer. And I, I repeated the prayer and I remember thinking, you know, is that all there is to it? And the next thing I know he's clapping me on the back and standing me up in front of the congregation and telling me that I'm saved. And everybody 
congratulated me on the way out. We all left and went to, to lunch, but I left there just as lost as when I came in. About two weeks later, I was just as lost when I was baptized because I never really understood what I was doing. I never understood the doctrines of, of grace and mercy. I lived a fake Christian life for, for a while. I, I had the Christian mask that I would wear and I would pretend to be religious. And I was probably about 16 at this age. And um, even then, sinful desires inside of me were growing. I can remember at, being at church and having sinful thoughts about other people there and other, other young guys my age. And I remember just telling myself, oh, it'll, they'll go away, it'll pass away. But yet it grew worse and worse as I went along. And sure enough, it wasn't that same year when in my late 16, being 16, I actually slept with the first male I ever had an opportunity to sleep with. And I remember at first being very shamed of it and repulsed by what I had done, but yet the sinful nature of me also was satisfied in, in the pleasure of the sin itself. And as time went on, I became more comfortable with it. And I just remember thinking that it was natural, it was normal, and that I was just doing something. I felt that guilt because I was doing something I shouldn't have been doing at that age, but it was really because I was doing something against God. That's where the guilt came in. Before long, I got a job and I started rebelling really against my parents in pretty much every way I could. I turned to drugs and alcohol and was exposed to it at work. I wanted to try to do as much as I could as a teenager and, and live as much as I could and, and rebel against my parents without really having to rebel and move out of their house. Eventually, my parents did kick me out of the house. We had a big big blowout and I ended up leaving and I tried to clean myself up a little bit after that because it was hard trying to live on my own so I tried to clean myself up and I thought well I'll join the Navy which had always been my my dream to be in the Navy I wanted to be a sailor I shipped out to boot camp and as soon as I got away from my parents that was just like adding fuel to the fire my sin really took off I was had an income I had no parental people to answer to I only had to answer to Uncle Sam, and I was exposed in California to all kinds of sins. It didn't take long before I actually got in trouble with my sins. I let the, my sins, all of them, the drinking, the drugs, the sex, get me into a, a state where I actually had to go into the hospital. And in the hospital, they ran several tests on me, and one of them was a drug test. And they discovered pretty much all my, my history of drug abuse up to that time. And, and also at that time my, my sexual sins came out and that was forbidden in the Navy to be a homosexual. Within a few, few months time my whole dream of being uh, in the Navy as a career was gone. So I had nothing left to do but to follow my, my gay friends at that time. They were Canadians and they were living in the States but they were being, going back to Canada. So I followed them and I left my parents uh, I didn't tell them where I was going, I just left and went. And for about two years I, I lived it up there in, in Canada and I didn't tell my parents at all where I was at. Where I didn't even contact them for all they knew I was dead somewhere. And I remember times where I would be get very depressed and think, you know, is there nothing more to life than drinking and doing drugs and, and this sin? And I was at a party and everyone was inside and and they were drinking and doing all sorts of things. And I was out on the pad of the balcony and I, I just, I was so tired of fighting in life and so tired of all of it. And I was so disgusted with myself that I, I wanted to commit suicide. And I told myself I could just jump off the, the balcony and 22 stories later, 23 stories later, I would be dead and there wouldn't be any, anything left. So. I decided I was going to do it, and I really was going to do it. I felt in my heart that I just was tired of, tired of it all. So I, I got up to the ledge, and I was going to jump. And right before I threw my leg over the, the ledge, I remember these thoughts just came out of nowhere. And one of the thoughts was, there's always hope in God. And I needed to find God to find that hope. And then the next major thought that really hit me was that I couldn't do this because it was wrong, it was a sin to take life, even my own life. And then the last thought I remember thinking was that 
I couldn't dishonor my parents this way. So I cried a little bit more and I ended up backing away from the ledge and leaving the party and I actually never saw most of those people ever again. And I continued to live my life though in, in drinking and alcohol. I didn't really clean up myself or I, I tried to but it didn't really work. And I eventually left Canada and, and went back home. I, I got caught working illegally in Canada and I got sent back to Texas. And I remember when I got back to Texas, at first everything was good. I was glad to be around my family and everything, but then I started feeling guilty for my lifestyle around them and my drinking and, and all the things I was doing. I, I wanted so badly to, to, to get away from them again. So my partner at the time was getting transferred and he's like, let's go to California. And I jumped at the chance to run, to get away from them, thinking that that would make me feel better. I could live my life how I wanted to. And so we went off to California. In California, things just, they didn't get any better. I wasn't a different person. I was just the same person I'd always been, just with a little bit more money now. I had a decent job. Um, I did all kinds of things I hadn't done before. I continued to decline in my sin and, and do more grievous, grievous things. I remember thinking if I could just, you know, try these other things, I, I, I would be happy, that that would make me happy, that I would be fulfilled, that I would be at peace. And even though with, I was never at peace with, with who I really was, there was always a part of me that deep down inside I, I knew it wasn't right, but I, I still wanted to pursue it. It was who I had become. I continued doing drugs and drinking and finally uh, I got really sick. I let myself uh, get dehydrated in it really bad and I ended up spending New Year's Eve in, in the hospital with the IV drip, getting rehydrated. And I didn't realize it, but at the time I had pneumonia and I left the hospital and I left there and I was really sick and the dehydration, getting hydrated helped make me better for a little bit, but eventually the pneumonia caught up with me and it, it ended me back up in the hospital. And I just remember my, my partner taking me into the hospital and the next thing I know, uh, it was the next day and the doctor was coming in and she was talking to me and she said that I had the worst case of double pneumonia she'd ever seen and I was massively dehydrated and had I not been brought in that I would have died. And I just remember I was grateful to God but I also remember thinking wow I'm so young and there's so many things I haven't done, so many sins that I haven't enjoyed. And so as I lay in the hospital the next few days recovering I mean, I was grateful to God. I did say thank you, but not in the real earnest way, in the sincere way. I was grateful that I had another chance to go out and commit sins against God, sins against Christ. So as I lay in the hospital, I planned and plotted what I was going to do first, how I was going to fulfill my lustful desires. And sure enough, as soon as I was able, that's what I did. I went out and, and lived for lust. I lived for drinking. I lived for drugs. And before long I was back in that depressed state again. Well, about this time I, I started going to a, a political action thing and there was a friend there who was a Christian and he was asking me if I was a Christian and I said, oh yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian. I've been since I was 16 years old and he asked me what my conversion story was and I think my exact words were, what is that? And I, I really had no idea what he's talking about. And he said, um, that's the story of how God saved you. So I relayed to him my walking down the aisle at church story and he seemed rather unimpressed and, and didn't really seem like uh, he believed it. And he kept asking me a few more questions and after he could sense that I was a little bit irritated, he, he backed off, but not before telling me that he really didn't think I was a Christian. He knew my lifestyle, he knew I was a homosexual, and he, he was trying to kindly show me that I couldn't live in that lifestyle and be a child of, of God. I didn't understand that. My eyes were blinded by the devil. I was living in unrighteousness and I was suppressing the truth, as it says. I started listening to the radio show hosted by Todd Friel, and I remember thinking, as I was listening to them talking, he was saying something about people that that didn't agree with the Bible usually had a low opinion of Scripture. And so that got me to thinking, well, 
I really didn't have a high opinion of scripture. I cherry picked what I wanted to believe out of it. I, I wanted to believe I was a child of God, but yet I lived this lifestyle that was completely contrary to what he asked. I broke pretty much every sin there was. I had stolen, I had lied. <laughs> I probably told 50 lies every day and it never bothered me. I, I did drugs, I lusted, I fornicated. I did all these things that were contrary to what a true Christian should do. Well, I, I started paying more attention to, to the show and what he was teaching and comparing what I believed to be true to what the Bible said. And I started reading the Bible. And I discovered that none of my beliefs matched what the Bible said other than Jesus Christ died on the cross. That was the only thing that really matched up to what I believed. I realized I had a God up here I was living for, a God that was okay with my sins. As it says in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 and 10, you know, there are multitudes of, of sins. I'm not trying to just harp on just homosexuality. Every sin will separate us from God. Every sin will doom us to eternity in hell. That shows us how holy God is. Sometimes it's hard for us to understand how holy God is. We'll turn it around and look at what the Word of God says, but look at it from the backwards. An eternity, one soul's eternity in hell, paying forever, punishment and torment, will pay the wrath of God, will pay the fine against a holy God. That's how holy God is. He's infinitely holy, more than we can ever understand. And it's only Christ's righteousness that is going to save us from that damnation that's going to save us. It was about this same time that my, my partner at the time, who had knew I was professed to be a Christian, he was always fine with it. But it was about this time that I really started reading the Bible and paying more attention to, to Scripture and, and comparing myself to, to what the Bible said. It was about this time that he started really being threatened by this whole thing. And he, he, really, he really fought against me studying and, and reading the Bible. In fact, at one point, he became really verbally abusive and, and started calling me all these names and, and talking about Christians and actually talking about Christ. And I remember when he, when he talked about Christ, I remember something inside of me just felt the pain of the, how wrong it was. I knew that, that he was blaspheming the Lord who had gave, given us all life. And so I'm sitting writing his words down and little did I know that the Lord was going to actually use that to really open my eyes to, to the truth of His Word. So I kept studying His Word and kept listening to the radio show and I realized that, that I really was living this, this life for me, not for God. I had never really been a Christian. I, at least I didn't think I was. I thought maybe, maybe I just re needed to rededicate my life. So. I started praying to the Lord to please have mercy and, and show me the truth and, and show me you know, how to live for Him. And about this time, everything just kind of fell apart. The only, the only positive things was the Lord had taken away my desire for drinking. I no longer drank like I once did. He took away my desire for any sorts of drugs. I no longer did any drugs. I didn't even smoke pot anymore, which was really glorious and I see now in hindsight that it was God's grace and God's mercy in, in giving me those things and he was making my mind sober where I could be able to to process and, and believe his truths. Once he opened my eyes to his truth I just started delving deeper into scripture and I realized that that I needed to get away from there that there was no way I was going to progress in my faith my my budding faith in Christ if I stayed there in that in that environment. So I moved back to Texas, my, my sister and my mom. I tried, to, I tried to repent to God. I tried to call out for mercy and I, I realized I wasn't saved. And I, I, I begged him to save me. But I just wanted to keep one sin to myself. I wanted to keep homosexuality to myself. In the back of my mind, I kept thinking, well, I'll find some way to justify it. I'll find some way to make it okay. I'll find some way to do it in secret. So the Lord obviously would never save me. And I spent from September 2008 up until December of 2008 crying out to the God 
to God to, to save me. I prayed that He would save me, and He wouldn't save me. And that I have a scripture here actually that He wouldn't save me until I actually repented of all my sins. I I went to my uh, my cousin's funeral in Amarillo, and where I'm from, his wife had died, and at her funeral she wanted the gospel preached. Well, the night before I had watched a sermon by Paul Washer called The Shocking Youth Message. And in it, Paul Washer talks about how it wasn't a matter of all we that we've sinned, it's that all we've ever done is sin. And I realized that was true in my life. All I had ever done was sin. I had never really been converted. I had never done anything good. I may have been nice in, at times, but I was never I never did anything but really sin against God. My whole life had been a sin against God. And I remember him saying that Jesus died for my sins, that he bore my sins on the cross. And I remember how it sank in that my sins were what put Christ on the cross. I was responsible for his death. He bore my sins, David's sins. At this time, I, I, I really begin to get a clear picture of what Christ was, what the cross was, and what he did on the cross. Up until this time, I'd never really understood what real repentance was, that it was a turning away from your sin, that it was more than just saying you're sorry. So up until that time, all I'd been doing was saying I'm sorry and trying to find some way to, to live in my lifestyle. But now I realize that I was without hope. There was no hope for me without Christ. That I was doomed to stay in this lifestyle. I was doomed to, to, to live out in sin and then go to justice where I belong, to hell. So I cried out to God to save me. And I went to my cousin's funeral and I sat there and, and her last request was that one of them was that the gospel be preached. So I sat in her funeral and I listened to the gospel and I heard the glories of the cross and what Christ did. And it just sank into me right now that that, that could be me in the casket. And if it were me right then at that moment, I would be going to hell I would be going where I deserved to go because all I'd ever done was sin. So I cried out to the Lord to, to forgive me and to just give me time to get home and to repent on my face where, the way He deserved. Later that night when everyone had gone and I was in my room alone, I got down on the floor and I confessed every sin that I could think of. I confessed my homosexuality. I confessed all my, my sins against God. I, all the ones I could think of. Everything. And I asked him to forgive me for him and to help me. I asked for him to forgive me of the secret sins, the ones I couldn't even think of at the time, the ones that I knew were sins to him that I didn't even know about. I asked him to please forgive me for how I'd lived, forgive me from running, forgive me from rebelling against him. Because I had always known that there was a God and that there was a Christ, but I just never understood what it meant to be in him what it meant to be redeemed by Him, what it meant to love Him, what it meant to, to serve Him, what it meant to be forgiven, what it meant to be regenerated. So that night I prayed and I begged Him, please, to have mercy, to, to give, forgive me, to help me. I didn't know how He was going to help me. I, I didn't actually even think it was possible. To be honest, I, I really didn't believe that He could help me. I'd never heard of anyone being saved from homosexuality. I'd never heard anyone with the hope in being redeemed from it. So I just prayed, Lord, I'm going to jump into this with faith in You. Faith that somehow you will, you will save me. That You will keep me from sinning. That You will make me able to stand the temptations. To stand what may come. And I went to bed that night not knowing if I was saved or not. But I woke up the next morning and I felt things were different. I didn't feel the guilt, the pressure of the guilt, the pressure of being under some sort of clock, the pressure of needing to make a decision, which had all been, the previous three months had all been that. They had been pressure and guilt and conviction. Now I know it to be conviction. So I knew something was different inside of me, but. I still, part of me didn't believe that I could be saved from homosexuality. I still went on and I doubted the Lord.
But then I found scripture here that says that I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Psalms 32, 5. And I remember thinking, finally I had, I had really repented. I, I understood what it meant to repent. I hadn't hid, kept anything hidden from him, even though nothing was really hidden from him. I hadn't tried to. I put it all out there. And that's why I felt different that day. That's why I felt different in the coming days was because the conviction, the guilt was gone. He had lifted it because he had saved me. And every day from that day forward, I felt, I truly felt the, the desires for those things to fall away. And now I stand and wonder, two, uh, almost two years later, a year and a half later, thinking, wow, God is so good. Here I was, I, I, I didn't believe him. I just leaped out in faith, and yet he did what he said he would do. He would take me, take those desires away. He would make me a new creature, just like it says in his word. He's given me a new heart with new desires. And I thank him, and I rejoice in what he has done for me. And I marvel at his goodness and his mercy to me and his long-suffering and patience. I feel compelled to, to share this scripture I had read it before, obviously, anyone who's a homosexual and, and, and listened to preaching or read the Bible has discovered this verse before, but there was part of it I had never noticed before. It's 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 through 10, and it says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators nor adulterers, nor idolaters, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. I knew that part, but verse 11 I had never known, I had never read before. And when I read it, I remember glorying in the, in the truth of it. And such were some of you, but you were washed, and you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And I realized that's what happened to me. I was finally justified by Christ, and I was made a new creation. I was predestined to be a servant of His, to, to serve God. And so now I rejoice that he, He's given me that, that new heart, that new desire, the new desire to go out and to serve Him and to do His will and to, to live for Him. Sometimes I'm, I'm still tempted, but I know that there's, there's nothing wrong. There's no sin in being tempted. Even Christ was tempted. So I know that I can turn to Christ in my time of temptation. So I, I take comfort in knowing that. And I also take comfort in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And I found that to be true. Every time I have rested in Christ's strength to overcome temptation, He has helped me. Every single time in every single instance, no matter what the sin was. But every time I would try to, to make do with my own strength, in, in my own strength, I fall. So I, I'm not afraid of what the future holds because I know I'm, I'm made right with with God through Jesus Christ, His Son, who, who suffered and bore the wrath, God's wrath, for me on the cross. I know that Jesus Christ has saved me from the power of sin, and He can save you too. And my hope is that anyone watching this video will turn away from that lifestyle, will turn away from their lifestyle of sin, whatever it may be, and be made right with Christ, be made right with God. And it's only through Christ, through repenting of your sins and turning from them and casting all your faith and your hope on Christ just as I did at that time when I just leaped out in a leap of faith to Christ and He caught me. And I remember thinking how impossible it was, but yet He did it. And I stand here today, a new creature in Christ, knowing that He has paid it all for me on the cross. And I have found my hope in Him. If you're not in Christ, you have no hope. There's no hope for you. So I pray that you would 
please consider the truths you've heard in this video. And please consider turning your life over to Christ. Surrender to Christ. Fall at the cross and surrender all your sins. Don't suppress the truth in unrighteousness, as it says in Romans 1. We all, we all do those things. I did it for many a year, even though deep down inside I knew it was wrong. Now looking back, I, I realize that, that it was wrong. And that's the repulsion I felt at the beginning of it. So I pray that that will be true for you, that you will be forgiven in Christ. Christ paid, my, my, paid for my sins on the cross, my past sins, my present sins, and the sins I'll commit in the future. There's only Christ can do that work on the cross. We can't do it ourselves. You can be freed from your sin. You can be truly saved. You can be truly set free from the bondage of whatever sin it is that's dragging you down, whether it's homosexuality, drinking, drug abuse, adultery, pornography, whatever it may be, Christ can set you free from all those things. That's what He did on the cross. Romans 4.25 says that He was delivered to death for our sins and He was raised to life for our justifications. That's how we become justified through Christ's work on the cross. When heaven looks down at us now, when God the Creator looks down on us, He sees me through, through Christ, through Christ's blood. He sees Christ's righteousness imparted onto me. It's nothing that I, have, that I do or that I will do. It's only Christ that saves me. It's only Christ that can give me hope. It's only Christ that can bring true joy and happiness to my life. And I don't mean in a monetary, monetary way. I mean in the way that, that brings true happiness inside with being right with God, being right with, with Christ, being a servant of Him. It's only through Christ that I felt that that conviction and that guilt pass away. Without Christ, there's no hope. If you're without Christ and you're not, you're not saved, you're facing God's wrath, be it from whatever sin, homosexuality, drinking, alcohol, whatever it is, if, if you sinned one time, which we all have, you're guilty of breaking all of God's laws. So the only hope that you have is in Christ. It's Christ's redeeming work on the cross. So I, I ask you to please cry out to Christ. Cry out to God. Cry out to Him to, to open your eyes to the truth that can be found in Him, to His truths and His Word. It's only through Him. The God of this world, which is Satan, has you blinded to the truth. And it's only through God's calling to you, through God's taking the blinders off you, that you will see the truth that it be found in His Word the truth that is found in Christ, the truth that is found in the cross. And if you truly are seeking that, cry out to Christ. He is mighty to save, and He'll save you today. Jesus says that we must be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. If we're not born again, we're never going to make it. We're never going to see Him. We're never going to be free from the, the bondage of sin. It's only through Christ only through that regeneration, that being born again, that we can be saved. I want to read a quote from John Newton. It says, I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world. But still, I am not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. And what I am is an undeserving sinner saved from, from God's wrath by Jesus Christ on the cross. And I thank Him every day for suffering with my, my, my running and my turning away. And I thank Him every day for, for calling out to me, even when I wasn't listening, even when I was running, He still cried out to me. And I thank Him for my salvation, and I thank Him for Christ and what He did on the cross. And I, I pray someday that those of you listening that, that are struggling with whatever sin it may be that separates you from God, that you will cry out to the Lord to repent for repentance and, and, and forgiveness and that you will truly repent and turn to Christ. If you're not saved, you examine your life and see that you need Christ and that you'll never be happy with that. Baptize you in the name of the Father.
I'llBeHonest.com. Jesus Christ, there is no hope. There is no truth with a capital T. There is no even external objects. There is no chair. There is just complete loss. There is darkness and there is blind searching out and just not being able to feel or find anything. My name is Michael. I'm from Columbia, Missouri. Um, I've been saved a little over a year, about a year and a week and a half. I was saved on campus, actually at the University of Missouri here. Um, there was an evangelistic outreach um, from a group in Kirksville. Winding backwards, there are a lot of threads that, as I've walked with the Lord, I realize more and more how great a tapestry it was. Um, starting back a little over probably about 10 years ago when I was about 13, 14. Um, I remember I sat in my bed because I was raised in a, in a house where God existed, but there was no real Christ. There was no real um, religion. It was just God exists, and if you're good, then you'll probably get something at the end of it. Um, but I remember hearing something about maybe God doesn't exist, God doesn't do all these really remarkable things anymore. So I sat in my bed and I said to myself, well, God doesn't exist. And I pulled the covers over my head and I wasn't immediately struck down with a lightning bolt. And so from then on it was sort of, well, maybe God doesn't exist. And it seemed to be, at the time, very freeing in terms of now I could do anything. You know, uh, I think it was Nietzsche who said that if God is dead, then all, things, all acts are permissible. So everything suddenly became open to me and I started looking for anything and everything that could explain anything, um, starting with the premise that God doesn't exist. And so over the years I sort of had this thorn in the back of my mind and I went to a Lutheran church. I asked a woman to be my godmother. That really came to nothing. I had no uh, drive or unction to read the Bible, to attend the church. Um, and so having all of that fail, I started really getting into philosophy. Um, I started really reading guys, you know, like uh, Descartes, Nietzsche, um, Freud, uh, the newer atheist guys later on, like Dawkins and Dennett and all of these guys, and basically searching and scrambling for absolutely anything that seemed like truth to me. It didn't necessarily matter if it was provable outside of myself, uh, just that it seemed right. Um, I mean, there's, uh, there's a, it says in scripture that there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is death. Um, and it really sunk me down low. Um, there was no real value to any of it. Um, I've still got the scars very faintly on my arm that uh, testify to how low I got um, in just depression and all of these other things. And I just tried to seek absolutely anything else. And so I tried to become this intellectual, try to go through men to find the reason for everything, since men are all that we have. Um, and so to that end, I started studying at the university philosophy and getting really into um, all of these theories about how you can't, going from Descartes, you can't prove anything outside of yourself, outside of your own mind. Um, as I've said to people before, I could really earnestly make you believe, at least entertain the idea that the chair I'm sitting in doesn't exist, that the house I'm in right now isn't real. You know, it's like Morpheus said in that, in that movie, you know, what our experiences outside of electrical signals interpreted by our brain. Mm -hmm. And if you go to the logical conclusion of that, really they're nothing, which means that we are nothing, which means that everything is inconsequential. So what's the point? You know, and it, that just sort of stuck and I started being okay with that. Um, but as I started studying more and more, I took a class uh, probably a year and a half to two years ago now on the varieties of religious experience because it seemed to me that regardless of my lack of faith, um, there was something still valuable about faith. Um, there was still that thorn that said that there was something amiss. Um, and so in the varieties of religious experience class, I really got a sense of a faith in faith and I valued people who had faith because it seemed like there was something else. I didn't know what, I was just looking for it in men. So the it became what I was looking for in terms of truth, lowercase t. Um, and so 
through seeking that in this class um, and through reading uh, one of Richard Dawkins' books, actually, a uh, strident militant atheist leading me to consider the things of God is pretty glorious. Um, he considered it a perceptual burqa, which is essentially what he means by that is that when you have a burqa, you have a very small window of perception, and there's so much else. And the everything else that humans can't possibly perceive was an idea that really stuck with me. Um, I really started considering what that could mean, what, if, it was these, if these religious experiences that I was learning about had anything to do with that, if there was any reality to them. A lot of them just seemed like, you know, they, they could just be anything that anybody happened to experience on a cold day, and it was just, okay, whatever. But there was something in the very core of it that seemed to resonate. It was something was more real than electrical signals. And so I just started thinking about that, thinking about those things, and I decided, okay, well, maybe there is something beyond human capacity. Very broad thought, but that was four days before that Kirksville Evangelical Outreach, um, where I was sitting and mocking a, uh, I'll be honest card, about uh, how you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And I was sitting with two friends of mine, we were talking about how ludicrous that is since you know, truth can't exist outside of uh, perception, and the perception is based on faulty whatever. Um, and we were just laughing about this, and a girl from Columbia came up and talked to me and just asked, can I, can I ask what you guys are, are talking about? Obviously she knew what we were talking about, but it was that conversation that really led to um, just me thinking about more and more the things outside of myself. Uh, after about an hour, my two friends left the conversation, tried to pull me away, and but there was something different about this person. There was something real, something that really struck me about this person. I couldn't put my finger on it, but um, I really wanted to continue talking to her, and so I continued talking to her for about two hours, I think, after that. So it was about a three-hour conversation at Speaker Circle. Um, and then we parted ways. Um, I think she was sort of pulled away because I guess a lot of people there are kind of used to talking to atheists and are sort of hesitant to follow up on that because there's a lot of just animosity. Um, I mean, I started mocking them. That's how the conversation started. So uh, it became very clear that what she believed, she believed so much more mm -hmm. than anything that I believed that she had to have some, some kind of truth that I was just not privy to at all. I had no idea what she was referring to, what she was pulling these arguments out of, because I was trying to get at her at any sort of argument that I could about morality questions, about really sort of painful questions about like abortion and all of these other things like murder and rape and all of these things. And really what struck me was that every single re response that she gave was essentially the gospel of Jesus Christ and the good news of his coming and his dying and the reality of sin and that's all that she would say. There was no argumentation, there was discussion about what I was bringing up, but the argument was essentially this doesn't really matter. What matters is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Mm -hmm. And she kept nailing that home over and over again. And by the time we split, it was there was a real drive to want to read the Bible, to see what she was talking about, if any of it was true. Um, and so I started asking around, you know, what, what types of Bible do you guys read? There was a bunch of translations. I'd heard all of these arguments about how we can't trust all these different translations because they've been translated so many times from so many different people. Um, but after a little while, there was a Bible that just sort of showed up. Uh, this friend of mine who came to Kirksville, uh, was talking about me. Apparently she had brought me up for prayer. Um, someone from the church had an extra Bible that they had happened to bring one day. Um, they just sort of said, oh, well, I already have one, but I'll bring this one just in case. It was a little small, tiny little guy. And uh, this friend of hers gave it to her to give to me, and I started reading it. And I started with John, um, and I started just really considering the things of God and wondering what was actually happening to the world, essentially. Um, and I continued talking to uh, this friend of mine who met me on campus and um, through a lot of these conversations about all of these things that I wanted to talk about, she just kept pointing me to the gospel, pointing me to the gospel and eventually it just 
broke down to I need to let go of all of these things that I'm starting with because I was starting from the position that God didn't exist. And so adding anything to that, if it sort of contradicted any of my previous premises, clearly some, something new had to be wrong. But I was unwilling to accept that God could exist. And so, um, you know, I was reading things on, uh, like, uh, uh, there was an article by Horatius Bonar about letting go and falling into the hands of God um, that was instrumental. Um, I was reading about uh, the Lord's work in people in Africa who had never heard the gospel, and he's saving these people. I was hearing about um, all of these amazing works that the Lord has done, all the while thinking that, okay, even if the Lord is real, then I must be reprobate. Because I, you know, he didn't care. I said that he didn't exist. I didn't believe. So, and nothing had happened to me. So clearly, he just wasn't paying attention and wasn't going to do anything for me. But uh, through reading the scriptures, through talking with this girl, through eventually just hearing her say, you need, just need to believe. You can do all of these things. You can try to figure out your own way, your way to salvation, but essentially what you need to do is just believe. You don't need to work yourself up. You can't work yourself up to a perfect righteousness because I've already sinned. You can't work your way to being heard by God because you've already sinned. You've already fallen short. And, you know, it It suddenly started to make sense. Yeah, okay, if all of this is true, what she's telling me, it's, co it's consistent with what the Bible is saying. So... I was sitting in my basement at the time, and I just decided, okay, well, I'll pray. I'll start just talking to the Lord and asking. I didn't know who I was I was talking to at first, but I started just talking. And the first few times, it didn't really seem like anything was happening. Nothing was really going on. Um, but I had told her that I had prayed. And she said, well, do it again and keep calling out. Keep knocking because the door will be opened. I didn't know what that meant at the time. But she just said, keep praying. And so I did. I prayed over and over again. And eventually it started to seem like something else was happening. I was no longer talking to my ceiling. I wasn't having my voice bounce off of walls. I was being heard. Someone was listening. Someone was understanding. And I was able to just pour out all of these things that had been going on. My animosity towards the idea of God because nothing happened to me when I was trying to prove that he existed or didn't exist as things may be. Nothing had happened. So clearly he wasn't there. I was really angry with him, you know, but who was I angry with? I, w I just kept asking him, if I could be saved, please, let's let me know. And I started just, okay, I'll test it. I'll say, I'll believe. I will believe just to see if anything can happen. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I tried to really clear out and scientifically test it, get away all of the other variables and just say, okay, the one variable that needs to be changed is I need to believe. So I started acting like I believed, and I prayed like I believed. And it wasn't like a, a play-acting type thing. It was really putting myself in the position to believe. And the more I did that, the Lord provided very little, very a few crumbs, but enough for me to go, this is more than anything that I could have thought of. And my faith just grew by leaps and bounds in those few days until the point where I really... Uh, <laughs> I believed that I believed, but I didn't really believe. You know, it, it was about a week-long period where I sort of believed that I believed I was going through these things. And uh, one day I work, I work night stock, so I stock shelves all night, and I was driving home one day. Um, and I was stopped at a stop sign. The sun was coming up in the morning, and um, there was these clouds in the sky, and the sky was really orange and all of these things, and it was just sort of a normal day, normal sunrise for the most part. But I started to... I was thinking on the things of God, thinking about Christ, and suddenly, I mean, I couldn't have told you at the time, but John 3.16, 3.16 suddenly became real and became about me. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Well, that became, for God so loved Michael, that he gave his only begotten son, that if I were to believe on him, I would not perish, but would have eternal life. And so that hit me as real, not just as an idea, like I've read it, but it hit me as a reality. And I'm looking at this sunrise and suddenly it pops it becomes this van gogh painting and all of these rivets in the in the paint start to become more real and as this happens i start to realize my sin if christ is real if christ has died for me how wretched am i what have i done to deserve this there is nothing that i could possibly do 
that could bring me to him, and yet he still has died. If he is real, and I am, in, and I am real, I mean, truth with a st capital T started to come in. If, if he is real, if he has died, and I am this wretched, what can I possibly do? What can really be real? And suddenly it all started to pour on me. My, I just started to get huge conviction, like, what could I possibly have been doing with my entire life? that I could put such just insult, insult to the creator of the universe. And the reality of Christ, the reality of my sin, the, the, the brevity of life, all of that, the, the beauty of all of creation that was testifying to God, all of it hit me at once. And, you know, there are so many people that have different so many different testimonies in that in that regard when all of that happens in stages but all of that hit me at once like a brick in the head mm -hmm. and I just started I, I broke down at my sin and I was laughing at my at, at Christ and just overjoyed that Christ was a reality but I was weeping at the same time well, that I had sinned against him I was crying and weeping and laughing and doing all of these things this huge mess of emotion on my drive home for the rest of the time and I just started, when I got home, I was calling out to the Lord, thanking Him for Jesus Christ. And just tables and chairs, suddenly I wasn't doubting their existence anymore. I was just so overjoyed that there was something outside of myself, some bedrock. you know. And when I got the reality of judgment, you know, it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. I was just so, I was, I was afraid, but it wasn't a fear that I, you know, I was going to fall off of a high building or something like that. It was, it was a reality of who he is. He had revealed himself to me a lot. I mean, I related so much to Saul when he was uh, condoning, I guess, the stoning of Stephen and when his garments were thrown at his feet. He was condoning it. He was endorsing it. He approved of it. He wanted it to happen, and then he, on his, he was on his way to Damascus to persecute more Christians. That's what I was doing on campus. As an atheist, I was sitting at speaker circle, talking to these people, yelling at these people, calling them fools. And Scripture says over and over again, the fool says in his heart, God doesn't exist. And it's, I mean, it, just how much hypocrisy there was. And when the scales fell off of my eyes, just so much glory was just poured in, just the reality that all of these things were made through Christ, for Christ, by God, through Him, for Him, all things are from Him and to Him and through Him. I mean, so much just opened up. The reality of the world suddenly just hit me, and all of these philosophies of men, all of these things that I'd been dedicating myself to, I've been spending so much time on, in computer games, spending so much time playing tabletop games like uh, like Dungeons and Dragons and stuff, just silly things, just wasting time just so that uh, until basically I was dead because there was no point to life, you know. All of it hit me in just this huge, wide swath of glory of, of the Lord and just what He is and who He is and what He's done, His perfect completed work on Calvary, just how much the Lord has worked from the beginning of time to bring us back to Himself. It's, it's, it's something that just I can't, I still can't fully grasp, it, the, the grace of it. It is truly by grace. If I had any choice in the matter, I really would have just continued to run into hell with my hands over my ears and my eyes closed screaming and slammed the door behind me because I had no reality whatsoever. But through the grace of God, He set it up that this this outreach happened, my heart had been changed the four days beforehand, just so many things happened step by step like a domino effect that I, I could not deny it. I could not, when, my, when the scales came off, it was like, it was seeing for the first time. And, you know, there's a, a classic philosophical dilemma of, it's called the Mary problem. You can know absolutely everything there is to know about the color red, say, and then, but in a completely black and white world. If she were to then leave that world and see the color red, say in a hallway leaving a door, see the color red, does she learn anything? Well, clearly she does. She has that experience of a reality, of a new, a t an entirely new reality, something that, that she couldn't have possibly imagined before. 
And when your eyes are open, suddenly you can see that, yes, there is something moving. There is a reality. We are marching off of a cliff into hell. Mm -hmm. And, but yet the Lord says, call and I will answer. Knock and the door will be opened. Mm -hmm. And it was through the grace of God that I was even able to see that. And yet, and through hearing the gospel, the power of God is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It, it, I, I just had this curiosity and I was led to read, and I was led to see more and more, and it was truly the work of God that, that opened my eyes to see just truth. You know, there was, I thought for a long, long time that religion was adding something to a checklist. I'm a, I'm a Christian, so I'm, I'm good. You know, I, I go to church even on Sundays, but the call to, the call for Christianity, the call that Christ gives to those who would be His disciples is forsake everything. It's come and follow me, and he demands perfection. And clearly no human being has ever been perfect unless they are also God. All have fallen short of the glory of God. There is none who does good, no, not one. And without Jesus Christ, there is no hope. There is no truth with a capital T. There is no even external objects. There is no chair. There is just complete loss. There is darkness, and there is blind searching out and just not being able to feel or find anything. And that really is the lost person in general. It is, it is the state of everyone outside of Christ. And so really the only way to find anything is through Christ, as all things are made in Him and through Him and by Him. And so I guess the, the exhortation really that I would have is to just let go of that rope of the sinking ship and just see that you that Christ is there, that there is a reality in Christ, and that He will not forsake those who truly seek Him in His means. There are so many false gospels, so many things that are just clean yourself up, repent of your, repent of your sins because you're doing horrible things, and that's it. It's repent and turn towards Jesus Christ because He is faithful to save. And that's just that's been the story of, of my life over the last years. As as things have gone wrong, as I've turned away from him, it's always been horrible and wrong and it just is these things that lead to death. And Christ, while I'm faithless, he is faithful to redeem and to save and to bring us back to himself. And so Amen. My name's Daniel, I'm 18 years old, and almost a year ago, God saved me. I stand here, I want to proclaim the gospel in my own testimony, and just how God did that work in me, that you too may come to faith in Him. Most of all, I want to, sh to tell you that there's no level of sin and there's, there's no amount of wickedness that keeps a man from God, but it's his own pride not to come. And for a long time, I was prideful enough to keep my sin in the dark. I, my dark deeds were not exposed to the light because they would expose them for what they were. And if that was true, God would have judged me. They were true. And He would have judged me. But you need to know that now I serve a living Savior. He's alive in me. And He's done a work. Please hear this testimony I have to tell to you that you may come to saving faith. God shows His love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And on April 23rd, 1991, I began my war with God. It's the day I was born. 
at age five or six, though God created me to mature and to and to be holy and pure before Him at age five or six Satan said your sexuality begins and I said yeah you're right and through elementary and throughout middle school Satan said this perversion continues and I agreed with him. And high school came. And I stopped. I stopped living my secret sexual lust. These actions that no one knew about except God. And the only reason it ended was a fear of man. Because I didn't want to stop doing it. I loved it. I loved I loved what I loved what killed my conscience. And if it if it could have been seen, it would have been a scarred brutally beaten body, almost to death. That's what my conscience was like then. And the only reason I stopped was because I was growing up and I knew what people would think if I continued this way and they found out. How I felt about people of my own gender and even my own flesh and blood and the things I did in the dark. The things that God's losses are perverse. He absolutely hates. No, I truly didn't stop doing it because it was an abomination to God. I truly stopped because I cared more about what people thought than anything in the world. Even more than my lust. That's how much I cared what people thought about me. Not because I hated sin, I love sin. But in the midst of this, me growing up this way, I began to isolate myself. Fear and shame became my outer shell. And I began to collect in the midst of all of it all types of materialistic idolatries but never truly worshipping or considering the God who created me and for that I'm ashamed I'm so ashamed With everyone applauding my good grades, I began the greatest abomination of all. In the midst of what I knew I was and had done and was still doing in my mind, though I physically stopped it, I actually thought I was better than most everyone else. And I looked to people's approval of of my behavior externally and my own conduct in school, I began to think of myself as good.
But if I had faced God in those days, if we, He would have rendered my life, and if He would have brought me right before Him, the angels would have been the ones applauding. And they would have been applauding my damnation. And my teenage churchianity only multiplied what I can imagine God felt toward me. A fierce wrath and wanting to pour out vengeance. Because I treated myself then that point in my life is redeemed and it was under a false gospel but God being the merciful savior that he was and he still is just showed me the consuming fire that He is and that blinding light He brought me face to face with Christ hope you're okay and love to everybody out there just a, a quick uh, video just to let you know what's happening I uh, just come back from a meeting tonight uh, at Salford University and a guy called Nicky Cruz was speaking uh, he was uh, he used to be years and years ago um, a, a gang member in New York and um, he got converted and he's a speaker now and he wrote a book called Run Baby Run and it's uh, a bestseller, it's been a bestseller for many years uh, and basically Nicky Cruz was a, a gangland guy into drugs, dealing drugs and um, his mum used to beat him when he was a kid uh, when he was nine he wanted to try to hang himself uh, in his teenage years he was just a vicious gang fighter and then uh, David Wilkinson uh, a preacher in the middle of nowhere some outback village town in America God told him to go to New York uh, to preach the gospel he gets there goes to the police says I'd like to preach the gospel to the gangs and they just thought he was crazy he went to preach to the gangs and they got converted and it's amazing and I have never been as blessed in a meeting in my life as I was tonight. It was such a blessing. Uh, other news, uh, street preaching is going well. Uh, back in Manchester now doing the Friday and Saturday run uh, in Piccadilly. If you want to come down, uh, give out tracks, do evangelism in Piccadilly, you're welcome to come. Really enjoying it, uh, finding it a tremendous blessing. Uh, through the week I go to various other towns and cities uh, around the UK with uh, other evangelists and been enjoying it and I, well not only have I been enjoying it it's been the best days of my life it's the happiest days of my life uh, and the blessing is just it is just wonderful really so I'm very grateful for that um, <coughs> so, but if you want to come down come around with us to the different places that we go you're welcome to come just come down on Friday Saturday have a word with me we can fix you up to come with us um, as long as you're an evangelical or, or you believe in the gospel um, so we yeah so if you want to come down I give out tracks and evangelize with us if you're welcome um, Yes, um, I'd like to stay later, uh, but I need more of a bigger team, um, especially in winter. So if you'd like to stop later, uh, till about nine o'clock in the evening, um, let me know. It'd be nice to have about five or six people to do that, but we don't stop later than uh, often till about seven o'clock. Very rarely do we stay out later than that. 
Uh, yesterday I stayed out till about 9 o'clock in the evening. Uh, I didn't have a team, I only had one person left. We had a team in the afternoon, but uh, in the evening we just had one person with me. But um, if you want to come and join us, feel free to do so. But the, the preaching, the open air, the evangelism, the things that we're doing, it's just being blessed and, and I'm really encouraged by that. Uh, the third thing, I'm doing a lot of studies. Um, really enjoying that. Uh, and it pays off. did a, quite a lot of study on the hadiths. It's paid off in discussing with Muslims on the streets. Uh, fourth thing, I'm just trying to generally stay away from the atheist. Um, I uh, you know, I wish every atheist well. Uh, I don't want to get involved in any of the drama on YouTube or connected to it. I just want to get on with what I'm doing, and that's just teaching the Bible online and doing apologetics. Uh, I might say hi to from time to time and have a bit of fun, you know, uh, every blue moon. But generally speaking, um, I'm just getting on preaching the the Word of God and just getting on with my thing really so so I wish all my atheist fans and friends and enemies out there just wish you all the best but those days are over I, I've moved on and uh, just getting on doing my thing and I'm always happy to have an academic debate I would love to have academic debates but I, I only want them with people who, who really feel that it's going to be a value um, so if you, if you ever do want academic debates serious academic debates where you, you debate me and then that's it you don't have a google hang out afterwards attacking me but you just want to do a formal academic debate I'm happy to do that but generally speaking I've moved on and, and I'm just getting on with my thing and I just wish everybody well uh, and so I've been enjoying teaching the Bible online on on YouTube and and doing general apologetics and I hope I can continue to do that and I hope a few people might find what I teach uh, valuable. Um, it's kind of strange being famous on YouTube, but not famous. It's a bit strange because. I'm out of it. I'm not. I'm not involved in it anymore. I'm not. I've not got a channel where I'm trying to promote what I'm saying or uh, against atheism, and I'm not trying to use people's names like Iron Rath Underfoot to get views or anything like that. So I don't. I'm not as in the public eye as I used to be. Um, but yet, people still make videos about me, and there's videos out there with massive views and. So it's a bit strange, really. But on the whole, I'm I'm content to to um, not be known and just just get on with what I'm doing, really. Um, but like I said, it's just a bit strange sometimes. You just think, look, look at that video they've made of me. It's like eight thousand people watched that. Look at that vid video. That that's another eight thousand views, and you just think it's crazy, really. Uh, but I'm just enjoying the an anonymity, is it? And just enjoying preferring to be out of the limelight and just teaching the Bible. And if I'm not well known, if I'm not famous, if nobody bothers with me, it doesn't matter it's just as so long as I'm happy and I'm happy teaching the Bible. Because that's me, really. That's what I'm made to do. Um, so, I just keep continue to do what I do and just teach the Bible. Um, I watched the World Cup, some of the World Cup because I missed some of it and I thought Germany was the better team and I'm glad Germany won so when they scored I, I was grateful that uh, they won because I think they deserved it. Um, Yeah, so I think I think uh, when the guy got hit in the face and the blood came down, the German guy, I just thought, well, the Germans haven't done any kind of stuff like that. They played fair. Uh, they were a better side. 
so fair play to them. I, I'm glad they won. Um, nothing else to report really. Um, been reading this book. Uh, I'll report on it. Melvin Bro uh, Melvin Bragg, the book of books, the history of the King James Version, uh, and I'll give you some information about it in the next day or two and from time to time when I'm doing Bible studies as well so so yeah so it's been, it's been an interesting read uh, and I've been doing quite a lot of reading um, so that's it really um, nothing else to report so look out for the Bible studies um, I think I'll probably do a lot of stuff on the Puritans in, in the next few weeks. Um, done quite a lot on the Church Fathers. Uh, I just want to say one or two things about the theologically. There's rumours going on that I'm a Catholic, and I just want to hit that on the head. I'm not a Catholic. I am a conservative evangelical. My theology is the theology of Francis Schaeffer and Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. That's where I'm at theologically. I'm a conservative evangelical. But I'm not a narrow-minded person. Um, there are many Catholic theologians that I will read. I don't necessarily agree with everything they do. You have to realise I have a degree in theology. I studied at MA level in theology, so I do know a lot of theologians and when I talk about theology, it doesn't mean theologians. If I do a, a, a talk on Karl Barth or um, or um, some Catholic theologian, it doesn't mean that I agree with that Catholic theologian. I believe that you, I believe that it's good to read widely, and so I will read Catholic theologians and I'll talk about Catholic theologians. And if people then think, well, Jason's a Catholic, well, that just shows your ignorance you know um, and also I appreciate some of the Catholic heritage the 9C creed is Catholic you know it, and it's our creed <laughs> you know St Augustine was Catholic and yet he's part of our heritage as conservative evangelicals so there's a lot of heritage out there that's Catholic heritage but there's also evangelical heritage so I, I I'm a conservative evangelical and also I think that there are some Catholics that are Christians and are, and even Catholic priests who become born again now I don't agree with them staying in the Catholic Church I think the Catholic Church has gone astray and has some really bad teaching that's dangerous like confessing to a priest the adoring of Mary purgatory and all the rest of it but I do think there are people of God in the Catholic Church and I'm not going to judge them who know Jesus wherever they are uh, but does that mean I'm a Catholic no does it mean I support the Catholic Church no so I wish people stopped talking about me and saying he's Catholic because I'm not a Catholic I believe in evangelical unity. I believe that wherever Christians are, whoever they are, whatever denomination, if they believe Jesus is the Son of God, they believe the Bible is the Word of God, they believe Jesus died and rose again, that he's the Son of God, God, man, in human flesh, if they believe the basic evangelical truths, whatever denomination they are in, they are my brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I, I take a, I, I've been a, in the Calvinist circles and I think a lot of it can be just narrow minded, narrow mindedness and I, I prefer to have a wide view of evangelical unity. I'm not for ecumenicalism, I don't believe in ecumenicalism where it's Catholics and Protestants together because that's that's denying biblical truth of we're saved by grace so I don't agree with that 
but I agree that in every denomination wherever the, there are people who believe in Jesus and the basics of the Christian faith we should be united together so I will meet and pray with Charismatics, Calvinists, Arminians I'll meet with any Christian who names the name of Christ believes the Bible to be the Word of God believes Jesus is the Son of God believes the Bible that Christ died and rose again that you're saved by grace, that you walk in the Holy Spirit any Christian who believes these things in a heaven or hell then they are my brothers and sisters in Christ and that is what I believe so don't call me a, a Catholic because I'm not a Catholic um, and that's it really uh, if you want to know my theology just type in Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones okay I'm going to go now uh, so watch out there's going to be quite a bit of teaching here and there and I'll report to you on my evangelism and outreach work and stuff like that continue to pray for me and like I said if anybody wants an academic debate formal academic debate uh, I'm happy to do one every six months or something um, anybody wants to do a Google Hangout on a topic let me know I'm, I might be interested in that but uh, so that's from me today uh, love to everybody whoever you are and uh, just have a good evening and uh, see you soon alright take care